Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Well, seeing that it's almost the end of May and that we're about to get thunderstorms for the rest of the week, I figured it's time to pop out for the May garden tour. So we can start right here at the entrance of the garden. And something really exciting is happening this year. My hedge of Bergart and Sage is blooming. Now I've had this hedge for probably four to five years. I started with only a few plants and I propagated it so heavily that I think it just didn't even have an option to bloom. So this year I only took about, I would say 16 cuttings. And so you can see the area that didn't have any cuttings taken from it. And it's really beautiful, semi-evergreen here in my zone 6B. What else is blooming here at the entrance is the tiny wine nine bark. I love all the nine barks. Tiny wine I feel is especially beautiful. And I just love how it's just naturally spilling over the fence. Really beautiful, a great cut foliage. Really great too once it forms its seed heads after it flowers, that holds well also. All right, so come on in. As usual, a lot of things have been harvested. You might see holes here and there, but my garden is a working garden. And so I want to show you the way a working garden looks. So right when you enter in, the hedge of Bergart and Sage continues. Now I did have a whole drift of daffodils here, and since I need to let their foliage die back, I planted in here some annual phlox and some California poppies. It's just starting to come on now. I'm gonna overlay a couple images also from mid-May when things like the viburnums were in bloom, the wigella, the irises, the alliums. We kind of miss that and I always feel bad. I feel like May almost needs two garden tours. But let me swing you around slowly so you can see a view of the main flower walk. So everything's filling in, but we're kind of in between blooms. It's basically all about the peonies and the ranunculus and a few hardy annuals right now. So here I just have a hedge of catmint. Back behind it, I planted some new peony roots just to start getting established. And then I put in some dahlias that I'm growing from seed. And can you believe one is already blooming here? <laughs> you know, right at the end of May. A little bit of bug damage, but you can see what we've got from this dahlia seed. And eventually that larkspur will be coming on. So I usually take you down the right side of the border first. So this time, why don't we go down the left side of the border and to the hydrangea garden, and then we can swing back at some point. So I'm sorry about the noise, guys. It kind of is what it is. So here I have a nice drift of feverfew, which is a wonderful cut flower, a nice spray flower with beautiful white blooms. You can also see that the service berry has its berries and we'll be enjoying those soon. In this area, I have a small hedge of lavender, which kind of goes all around here, circles around this Winecraft Gold smoke bush, and then stops at the Cleome. So I kind of just stuck in a few extra seedlings in this area, mainly some Madame Butterfly snaps that we'll be seeing later on in the season. But like I say, it's really all about the peonies right now. Here we have Festiva Maxima peony. So when we first moved here, um, there was nothing on the property six years ago. It was just kind of uh, an abandoned woodland area, if you will. And all the way back there in the corner, in the dark shade, was a small section of peony roots. They didn't bloom, of course. And so I moved them, I divided them into three, and that's the Festiva Maxima peonies that you're gonna see around the garden today. I have some Cleome here, and then back behind it, which looks small, but is very exciting for me personally, is lupin that I grew from seed. I did the winter sowing method on this lupin. And here's the mahogany splendor hibiscus that I've been growing from seed. Some people were asking me how big it was so far. 
So I'll try to point those out as we walk around. So you have to kind of imagine that filled in there with that nice um, burgundy color. Lots of lime lights on the property. They're kind of all different ages and you can really start to tell the difference in sizes. This one is probably three years old now. We can take another look at some more Festiva Maxima peonies. I think it's really worthwhile to plant peonies. Some of them live up to a hundred years, a really easy care perennial. And I wouldn't worry about that first year. Now, the first year they really don't do much at all. Don't worry about that if you plant the root for the first time ever. The second year they look good. The third year they really start to look great and you can cut on them. And now back behind here, I think I showed you the other day, is some Siberian iris. And in bloom just a few weeks ago was the bearded iris. Here we have a female winterberry. And underneath that, we have some lamb's ear from my grandma's garden. And I'm hoping to kind of, you know, as it grows and fills in, continue to move it all along this area here. And then I just have some echinacea, our native echinacea, planted sporadically through the area. Some more Siberian iris. And I picked up this birdhouse. I'm not sure if I showed it to you yet from a little Amish boy down the road. He actually saw me putting the money in and he got out on his scooter and came right down to get it himself. He was very excited. So that made it even more of a joy to purchase from him. Here I have a Japanese cedar that I put in only four years ago, I think. It is quite a fast growing evergreen tree and I really love it. So we'll just circle around here now. So you see all my dog's toys and actually my, um, my mom's parents, their dog is here as well today. But this tree I get asked about a lot. This is a Kusa dogwood. And if you have trouble with that native dogwood, the one that gets the flower first and then the leaf, you might want to think about the Kusa dogwood. They don't seem to have the disease issues that our native dogwood is starting to have. So back here is the hydrangea garden. I believe this is an endless summer hydrangea and I'm going to move that over to the new shade garden that I've started to create. But this is Invincible Spirit 2, one of my favorite hydrangeas. It gets beautiful pink blooms and I have five of those coming to make a hedge behind the swing. So I'm hoping that we can get to that hopefully by the end of next week. Now guys, I found something really special at an antique store recently. Do you see that metal hummingbird sign? Well, some of you might know that my grandma has a botany scholarship in her honor called the Hummingbird Award, and that's why it's my logo. And I happened to find that at an antique store recently, and I just thought it was a way that she was speaking to me here in the garden. So the hydrangea garden really looks just mainly green right now. And I think that's a good lesson for me to see that I need to bring in some other foliage color here. Any suggestions that you might have, uh, please let me know as always. More than happy to hear any ideas that you all might have. I know y'all are wonderful gardeners. And just in case you're new here, my whole garden functions as what you could either say is a very small flower farm or an incredibly large cut flower garden. But basically I plant everything for the sole purpose of cutting it and selling it at our farm stand here on our driveway. So I think what we have here is a mini Mauvette hydrangea. The big one is one I planted pretty early on. That's Haas Halo, which the pollinators love Haas Halo. Um, it's kind of a lace cap smooth hydrangea. I believe this one is Strawberry Sunday. 
Or is there another one also called Vanilla Sunday or Vanilla Strawberry Sunday? I don't know. Sometimes they make the names really confusing, but you guys know what I'm talking about there. It's a paniculata hydrangea that starts out white at the base and then gets pink. This area is also turning into my dried flower area. Here's a limetta hydrangea, a grass, and a crepe myrtle. But what I'm meaning is that I'm putting a lot of the cut flowers that I mean to dry over in the hydrangea garden. So for instance, we have a drift of straw flower here, and everything is grown from seed, of course. Then we have a drift of so, wait a minute, star flower. <laughs> Sorry guys, need another cup of coffee today. This is star flower, also great for drying. Now I was really thankful a viewer sent me some paper daisy seed. This is my first time growing paper daisy. It looks really interesting so far. So that's the paper daisy for drying. The Ringo Rose is in bloom and looking gorgeous. And then one more dried flower, which doesn't look like much at all yet, but that's Crespedia. So this is all Crespedia looks like at this point in the year. So yeah, guys, that's the uh, hydrangea, quote unquote, dried flower garden. Why don't we actually go over to the raised beds and then we'll swing back around to the right border. So this area might look a little bit different than the last time you saw it. I was originally working with six boxes, which my husband built, but he was wonderful. And for Mother's Day, he not only built me two more boxes, but he also installed another portion of fence that I had been hoping for. So I can show you that as well. But these front boxes are where I have my dahlias. And the difference here being that mainly this bed I started inside and this bed, I just planted the tubers. And I think we only really have one up here. And I saw something from Santa Cruz dahlias who I really respect. She surrounds her dahlias with alyssum. So I, go, I went ahead, I bought a packet of alyssum seed and I seeded it all around the edge of this bed. And that's to help just ward off a lot of bad bugs. Well, not necessarily ward off the bad bugs, but it attracts good bugs to take care of your bad bugs. That would be a more appropriate way to say that. Now, here we are at some beds you might be more familiar with. The first one is our ranunculus bed. And I've pretty heavily picked this bed already, so you're kind of seeing what remains. But we have a lot of nice vibrant reds beautiful yellows, lots of pink. Sorry guys, I have harvested most of the pinks and sold them at this point. I hope you don't mind. But even look at the center, you know, when you let them bloom out, just really absolutely stunning. And if you're new to growing ranunculus, just remember it's not too hard. It's just all about climate. And if you can find someone that's close to you, that's having success with ranunculus, I would really become their friend and just ask them as many questions as you can. Gardeners are wonderful like that. They're always willing to share. But I do have a video on how I plant them here in 6B without a high tunnel if you would like to check that out. So the second bed is full, oh, I tripped a little bit there, guys. The second bed is full half of nigella and half of gladiolas. And basically all, this year I'm using all the nigella for seed pods. So I'm letting them all bloom, turn to seed pods, and then I'll go ahead and harvest them. And I'm picking a few flowers here and there just for, you know, a bouquet for myself or something. But this year I'm really amping up my dried flower work. I actually have some orders already for dried flowers and I just love dried flowers. I'm so glad they're making a comeback, but really easy to grow guys. Just direct sow these in the fall and look at that. They'll be blooming like that by the end of May. So we've got our glads here. This bed has very recently been flipped. Not even probably three days have passed since I flipped this. So we did have all the apple blossom snaps here and I've used all of them. 
And instead of waiting for them to send out a second flush later on in the year, I just took them all out because I have Madame Butterfly snaps in the driveway garden. And I felt like it was better to just go on and use those than waste this space on the apple blossom second bloom. So I just put in some basil and then some banana peppers. And then we have some bells of Ireland, which what was going on here, so we had all the apple blossom snaps and I had seeded bells of Ireland in the fall. They really didn't come up that great. So I just thought, all right, well, I'll just forget about that and plant the apple blossoms here. And then of course, as the apple blossom snaps were getting tall, all of a sudden, all these bells of Ireland started popping up. So I moved some of them. Um, so that's why the spacing looks weird on these. And actually after this tour, I'll probably come out and net this whole bed. But you can see some of the bells are starting to form there. And then here we have some more scabiosa, not blooming yet. Um, this bed has orlea and also carnations. It's just starting to bloom now. A really beautiful lacy texture. Great for wedding work. Right in front of me in this bed is Ardara. And over here in this bed is white light pro cut sunflowers. And as far as the island of misfit flowers goes, I think what's going to be the main problem here is not really the competition from the other cut flowers or the sun, but it's really going to be support and weeding. So it's hard to say if this is really going to be a, a area that I just neglect and see what happens. I shouldn't weed, right? I shouldn't stake. Um, I don't know. It's something I didn't really think about, but the weeds are quickly taking over. A lot of things bloomed and then fell over, of course, because they had no support. But these are all my extras. <laughs> so this is a rocket pink from last year and it's standing up on its own. OK, you can see like here I have some Orlea that was left over. The Bells of Ireland, I think, is winning in terms of health over here. So, you know, we'll just see how this goes. It was just kind of a fun experiment this year to just see what happens, to just throw all my baby extras over here and see who survived and was able to flourish all on their own. Well, now that we've seen that, and some people ask to see more farmy stuff. So let me just show you. We did have a wood pile here um, for many years. And as I was going through it recently, I was noticing some spotted lanternfly eggs on it. So we went ahead and disposed of that as Penn State recommended. And what I'm going to be doing now is just cultivating this area and planting some sunflowers here. But I guess I do try to hide my more farm stuff, if you will, back here you know, the compost and everything. I just do cold composting, which is basically you throw it in there and it takes a lot longer to break down, but it still does break down. So I am able to have compost every year. So here we just have our black raspberries. They're looking good. I'm not sure if I've ever showed you guys the pear tree. We can take a look and see. It looks like it's going to be a good year for our pears. But I want to show you something I've been working on. So let me take you all the way down and then we'll walk this direction. So here's something else that's new on the property. This fence here just used to be cattle fencing just to go ahead and keep our dog in. But we did go ahead and replace it with decorative fencing. And as soon as that happened, it really made me want to get a jump start on the shade garden. So all this stuff is brand new. I don't think any of it was here in April. So my thought is this, that one day I would like the shade garden to just move very organically all the way down to those arborvitaes and surround all of these apple, cherry, and pear trees. And then I think I'm also going to bring this garden out 
and connect it with this apple tree and kind of mirror the plantings and then just have a few stepping stones over to this way so that you really feel like you have um, a shade garden hugging you from both sides when you enter from this gate. But all in good time. And quite frankly, I'm so busy selling flowers at this point in the year that you know I'll get a little bit of this done every year. All the sun has decided to join us. So this garden I am calling Gracie's Garden or Grace's Garden. But these are only plantings that were already on the property. I just took divisions of things that were already here. And I did get some lamium from my mom. You can even see some holes already dug waiting for, um, what did I order for here? Tough Stuff Aha Hydrangea to put right there. So basically we're gonna have hostas, lamium, and blue hydrangeas, either the microphylla hydrangea or a mountain hydrangea. And there are fruit trees here, like this is an apple tree right here, that if I pull it down for you guys, you can probably see this is a summer rambo apple right above us. So we do need it to be a practical garden too because we do have to harvest around this area with tall ladders. This area, I made kind of a pathway here because these two trees are tart cherry and once again we have to have some big ladders over here to harvest them so i just don't want any plantings to bother us when we were doing that this year i really need to film for you guys this tart cherry pie recipe from my mother-in-law maybe we can harvest cherries together and make that pie it's the most wonderful pie I've ever tasted. It has kind of that tart and sweet thing going on for it at the same time. But guys, this is basically where I've stopped with progress on the shade garden. I've moved some big leaf hydrangeas over here. I have another box of lamium from my mom, but I hope it just gives you a sense of where I'm trying to go with Gracie's garden. So now let's head back over and see the right border.